come join us as we explore what it means to be the church and study God's purpose and intention for us as the body of Christ in this place. Well, as we've said, it's the season of Advent, which means Christmas is right around the corner. So I have a question for everyone here. How many of you have your Christmas trees up already? Any show of hands? Got a couple? Okay, okay, so we got a few early folks there. Yeah, Chantel was getting on me. Oh, what, do you guys have one up too? And not for lack of trouble. Well, yeah, see, that was Chantel's hope. Chantel really wanted to put up a Christmas tree already, uh, but we weren't able to make it out on Saturday, uh, so that didn't quite work out for her. We usually like to do it as well, first day after Thanksgiving. That's a little early for me, but if you pop over to our house, you can see all the other Christmas things are already up. I mean, we put up Christmas trees, and we think about the Christmas tree. Uh, you know, the, the legend goes that it's supposed to be something that points us up towards God. You know, the shape of it directs us towards heaven, so our mind, our thoughts goes there to heaven. But I'll be honest with you, when I see a Christmas tree, I don't think of what it's pointing up to. I normally think of what's under it. Uh, I'm just, a, I gotta say, I like presents. And so when I see a Christmas tree, I think of all the presents that get to go under it, that'll be under it for Christmas morning. And I'm always excited for that. But have you ever received a present you don't like? You know, you get a present, someone, uh, maybe it's someone close to you, or maybe it's some, you know, random relative you're a little bit surprised to get a present from, but, but you get it, you open it, you look at it, and there it sits, some random kitchen appliance, or, or, or maybe, a, you know, a game you already got three copies of, or that terrible sweater, and you look at it, and you know, what are you supposed to do? Oh, you're supposed to say, oh, I love it. That's what I wanted. You got to put that smile on your face. I see a few people recognizing that. Yep, yep. You got to act like you love it. So in your mind, you know that as soon as you get the chance, that's going in the closet. It's going with the other pile of gifts. And once you've given enough time, once you've made a safe amount of time away from Christmas, you can go ahead and uh, package that back up again, and you re-gift it. Uh, that, that, that's what we even have that word, re-gift it, because we get rid of it. Well, today with the verses we're looking at, we're reminded that we have a gift-giving God. We have a God who loves to pour out gifts on us, and He knows, He knows exactly the gifts that we need and the gifts that we can enjoy the most. But sometimes, sometimes when we get gifts with God, we sort of treat them like that type of gift, where you open it and you look at it and you might say to God, God, that's, that's wonderful, I, I'm, it's just what I wanted. But you know in your mind, you're just waiting until you can put that up on the shelf, back in the closet, not to be used. See, that's what happens when we don't use what God gives us, when we don't use those gifts. But if we're to be the church that God has called us to be, then what we are to do is first see that we have a gift-giving God, know that, but then we've got to use the gifts that He has given us, not just put them away in a closet because we don't want to deal with them. We need to see who He is, and we need to use those gifts. See, it's just like, you know, a parent, you know, on Christmas morning, just love, loving to see, you know, children opening up their gifts. God knows that we will get great joy of it. He longs for, to see us use these gifts because He knows they're for our best, and yet sometimes, sometimes we put them away. So if we've done that, we need to take those out of the closet, we need to open them up, and we need to put them to use. Now, it's a struggle like that with gifts and using them, and using them rightly, that Paul is confronting today in these verses. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, which Dan read for us already. Uh, if you're not there yet, please go ahead and open your Bibles to the, that, that chapter. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. If you've been with us the past couple weeks, you've noticed that Paul has been addressing some problems in the church of Corinth. They've been having a problem with factions. Now, most of the letter has been about problems in, with factions in the church. That's people taking different sides and making different teams and causing issues in the church. But for the last couple of weeks, we've been dealing with these factions as they show up in the church service itself. And that is, as we've seen, that there were issues between men and women in their roles in the church. There were issues at communion time when it came to the rich and the poor. 
And they're using that time for, uh, that was supposed to be for unity. They were using it for division to show who, who's really important and wealthy, you know, and, and, and who's really not and can, can sort of sit outside and get the least. Well, now we get to spiritual giftings. And, and it might seem a little crazy, but, but it happens here. They are even dividing over their use of gifts, and they're not using them the right way. So we're going to look at these verses today, and as we do, it starts with this, as Paul jumps us into this topic, that everyone, including you, everybody, you have a gift, you are gifted by God. And then he turns to, okay, what, what is the purpose? What do we do with that gift? Well, what we do is use it. And then finally, what, what do you not do with your gift? Dealing with some of that problem in Corinth is, well, you don't abuse your gift to cause division. So that's where we're looking today. You are gifted, use your gift, and do not abuse your gift. And it all starts with this. You are gifted. And that's something we have to let sink in a little bit. At times we might say, well, I don't feel that way. But as we read here, you have been given a gift for a purpose. Paul starts it out this way in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. All right, now concerning, Paul is, is changing our focus here. He's turning us over to these spiritual things that he's talking about now. And we see that there's an issue in Corinth because apparently they were uninformed. They didn't know the right things they were supposed to know about their spiritual gifts. And, and the truth is, even as he's talking to the Corinthians, the same can be true for us sometimes. Maybe you are uninformed. Maybe you, are, you have been uninformed about your spiritual gift or how to use it. Perhaps you've wondered or asked the question, God, how could you really use me? You know, how could you use me for something that you're doing? Or, or, or maybe, maybe if it's not that question, you could be asking the question, am I really gifted? You know, have you really given me a gift that I can use? Well, we know this. You do have a gift that God has given you, and God can and we'll use you. Okay, so how does this all start for us? Paul sort of takes it all the way back to the beginning to make sure we have a clear view on how this starts. So like with the Corinthians, he wants them to realize this. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, no matter how, however you were led. You know that you were, when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. We all came from the same place. Paul's taking this all the way back to the beginning. He's dredging up some of that old life where we all started, where it all began for us. Well, we were pagans. I'm sorry, that means each of you too. You're all pagans at one point in your life. Hopefully you're not now, but you didn't follow God. In fact, you were led by your culture. You were led by your culture to these mute idols that Paul is talking about here. And it may be different for different people, even as he says here, well, it may, may have indeed been different. However you were led, though, you were led to them. Now, those mute idols, they had no power. They have no power, but they still control lives. And they might have, and at one point, they did control your life. We all started from that point. Paul wants the Corinthians to see that, and we need to see that as well. That that was us at one time, but we do not serve a mute God. Now, you could choose to run after your idols. If you do that, you, you will be powerless. But you can make that choice, or you can choose to serve this God who is active, this God who has gifted you. See, when we think about idols in our lives, there are many idols we can have. We've talked about idols a number of times as we've been going through 1 Corinthians because Paul brings it up a lot. There are a lot of things that can steal our attention from God, but an idol essentially is something that takes you away from God, that you put in the place of God somewhere in your life. We have plenty of those, and Paul is saying here is those are mute things. They have no power, and you can serve the true and active God. And if you have walked with God any amount of time, you know he is not a mute God. He is active, and he is alive. I, I know even in just the past few weeks, we have seen God at work in our lives as we've dealt with one health issue after another. God has been there. He has shown his love directly and through the people that he has called. It has been amazing to see that confirmation. But if you walk with him, you see that God is not 
mute. But what causes that change then? What moves us from a position of following, being led to these mute idols and following them to a point where we are gifted by God, that we're called to Him? Well, that's the change. So Paul's making his argument here. We all started in the same place, you Corinthians, and we all had the same experience that brought us out. Verse 3, he says it this way, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. You might read that in the context of this chapter. You might say, well, Paul, what are you talking about here? What does this have to do with gifts? What it has to do with gifts here is this is where the change happens. Why do you not serve those idols like any, everybody else? Why is it that you can serve an active living God and receive these gifts? Because you have a new Lord. Because you can say Jesus is Lord. If you haven't done that, if you haven't made that step, then you're living as though you're saying Jesus is, uh, well, it says here, cursed. The word is a word that shows up occasionally in English, though I'm sure I'll get some funny looks. It's the word anathema. Anathema, that's a, that's a fun word there. It's used sometimes uh, to speak of things being accursed, but what it literally means is given over to the gods. In other words, you view them as nothing, as though you can just toss them away. It's something to give away. Well, that's the difference here. Do you see Jesus as your Savior and Lord, or do you see him as just a throwaway, something that's not really important to you? That's where the change happens. Because one time you would have said, Jesus is anathema. Jesus means nothing to me. But now, if you've come to faith in him, you can say, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. And Paul's reminding these guys that there's only two teams. They want to make all these different factions within the church. And Paul's saying, there's only two teams. This is where you come from, but there's only two teams here. And, you know, occasionally we can get a little uh, sidetracked on that, or we can, we can listen to the world that tries to present that there's a lot of teams you can choose. You know, if you look at the world the way that it sets it up, you know, it might say, well, over there is a, you know, let's say there's, there's a Muslim team, there's a, you know, a Buddhist team, there's a Sikh team, there's, there's maybe a Christian team, an atheist team, an agnostic team. And, you know, basically there's good people in all these teams, and they're all working towards some good goal. That's, that's how a, you know, pluralistic society likes to put it. But that's not how God sees it. There are only two teams that God sees. That is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. That is those who accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, and those who don't. Only two teams there. Now, as Paul's getting into this, he's trying to make the case that there should not be teams within the kingdom of God. There should not be factions within the kingdom of God. Those who say, hey, I'm a better Christian because of this, or, you know, or I'm more gifted than this person, or, you know, here's clergy versus the lay people. No, there's only one team in the kingdom of God, and that's the team of the kingdom of God. But the Corinthians weren't seeing that. The Corinthians were breaking it up. But in truth, we all come empty-handed to God, and we all receive great blessing. So what do we gain here? What do we gain in this? Verses 4 and 5 here, Paul says this, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. All right, so, starting off, he doesn't want us to be uninformed. We all came from a point of being pagans. We all had to go under, undergo this change to being able to say that Jesus is Lord. And what do we get out of it? Where do we end up? Well, we gain so much. If we talk about it, we could say, yeah, we gain life itself. We gain peace with God. We gain a proper way to view the world. We gain eternal life. We gain communion of the, the communion of the church. And here, what Paul is pointing out specifically, we gain these spiritual giftings so that we can be a part of the body of Christ. Now, Paul does break it down into some divisions here. He has three divisions that he gives us, but the gifts themselves aren't divided. He's using these divisions to show the unity that's here in these gifts. And in fact, he links that to the unity in, in the Trinity, the Godhead. He talks about here God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit 
and how the gifts come from God, the Trinity here. So he talks about these varieties of gifts, or I might say the distribution of gifts as they're given out. He starts with this one. He talks about a distribution or a varieties of gifts from the same Lord. I'm sorry, from the same Spirit. There are a variety of gifts from the same Spirit. Now he's talking about here, when he says Spirit, Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit. And when he says there's a variety of gifts, the word that he uses there is the word charisma. You know, we, we actually use that term still in our language, usually meaning you know, some sort of a good standing, some good reputation, a good way of influencing people. But the word actually means something of grace. In other words, he's saying here that we all receive this distribution of gifts from the same Spirit. We all receive this free gift. This is a grace gift, something that is freely given. You didn't pay for it. You didn't do anything for it. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. He also says there are varieties of service from the same Lord. Now, when Paul says Lord, he's talking about Jesus Christ. That's what he's using here. So he's saying that these come from Jesus. And, and the, that word service there comes from the word diakonia, where if you might notice, that's where we get our word deacon from. That is uh, a, a service, uh, an act of duty, an assigned duty that one might have. So it's a task of service that's directed towards others. And then last, he says that we have this distribution or, or this uh, varieties of activities uh, essentially from the same God. And when he says God, he's using that to refer to uh, the Father. It says that you have these different activities, the variety of activities from the Father. And he uses that word there, this word, one last word for you is energema, where we get the idea, we get our own word energy from the root word of that. But what it means here is that it is, uh, comes from the ideal of ability or capability. You're able to do something. All right, so Paul here isn't saying that there are three distinct divisions of gifts. Because if that, there, if that were the case, people would try to rank them. But what he's saying is that all these gifts fall into these three categories, and every bit of it is done by God. Because every gift that is given is a grace gift. You did nothing to receive it from the Holy Spirit. Every gift you have also indicates an assignment. You have a service to do with that gift. It comes along with the gift, and that's given to us by Jesus. And every gift you have empowers you. It empowers you to do that task. So you can't look at it and say, I can't do this, God. Because God is the one who provides the power, the energy to do that. It's a power that comes from God the Father. And everyone receives such a gift. As we're all part of the body of Christ, we're all gifted in that way. And it's God who empowers all of them. All right, so Paul is making a pretty clear statement. We have a gift from God. We each have a gift from God. We have a gift that's given by the Holy Spirit. We have a gift that's assigned to us by Jesus. We have a gift that empowers us by God the Father. And we have something to do with it. Now, if we, if we could really wrap our minds around this, if we could really like allow this to enter our lives, I mean, we, we, would, we would daily be transformed by that. I mean, imagine for a moment, if you lived... If you live consistently as though you believed what this said, this would change your life. It reminded me of a quote by D.L. Moody, and I think Moody probably stole it from somebody else, but I'll just take it back to him, where Moody said this, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. That's, that was a quote that I learned as soon as I went to Moody back in, 2000 in 2005, so a couple years ago for me, and uh, I have pondered that ever since, you know, and, and Moody followed that up by saying, God, let that be me, and, you know, and the truth is it wasn't for Moody, but imagine what that would be like in your life if you could take this, that God, that, that is the eternal God who created everything, who, who sent a son to love you, you know, who, who sent the Holy Spirit to empower you, that, that he, he truly wants you to be part of his work, and that you can be part of your work, and it will be the greatest thing of your life when you enter into that work, and that he does all the effort for you, and you can accept that, and you can make an eternal difference in lives. 
if you walk with that, I mean, imagine what that could do to our lives if we lived like that is true. And that's a struggle for us sometimes. But we have the ability to walk towards that, to see beyond that veil, to see what He can do. So, you're gifted. Will you do what God has called you to do? Or are you going to go back and do something with your idols instead? You know, we see the argument Paul is setting up with all these things he's putting together. You have a choice. The creator of the universe wants you to join with him in this work that he has gifted you for. And it could be an amazing experience, but you also have the freedom to choose to go back to the idols, those mute idols that you know have no power, you, you know have no real control, or no, no, no ability to make your life better, and yet they're easier, and so sometimes it, it's simpler to just go back to them. I, w- I was listening today uh, to a, a, a lady talking about uh, something called dopamine addiction, and I don't know the whole thing she was talking about, but I thought it was interesting how we get so caught up in these things, and, and she was talking about like using your phone or, or reading certain books that just totally capture your attention, and you just focus on these things, and, and your body eventually adjusts to the feeling of receiving these so that you always want them, but they're never good for you. They never do you any good, and they take you away from good things. That's, that's how idols work. They take you away from the good things. And the truth is that when we turn to God, the degree to which you trust Him in this, the degree to, to which you, you take this and say, this is true, and I'm going to live this out in my life, that He really has gifted me, that will determine the degree to which you experience that transformation in your life. Yeah, it's like when Jesus was talking about faith. He said, if you had faith as small as a mustard seed, you know, if you had just a small amount of faith, you'd be able to say to this mountain, remove from this place, you know, send it into the sea. Well, we are given this gift we don't deserve, an assignment that will fulfill us, and the power to do what we could not do on our own. Now, maybe, maybe it's true you would just as soon sit back on your couch and not get involved with what God has called you to do, but that's not what you're called to If you've been given this gift, you've been given it for a reason. You've been gifted to use your gift. So just one verse I wanted to look at for this one, verse 7 here, because Paul pours so much into it. You could call this a key verse for this section, because how are you to use your gift? If we hold that this is true, that you've been blessed in this way, how are we to use this gift? Well, he says here in verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, that is a verse to memorize. That's a verse to get down. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Let's just think about those points there. It says to each. That's a reminder here that you all have one. You can't say, you can't look to God and say, Oh, God, you forgot me. I didn't get one, so I'm off the hook. I don't, I don't have to worry about it because you apparently, you didn't put that present under the tree for me. No, he did. It's there. And may, maybe it's already in your closet too, but he gave it to you. You have it. It's, it's just on you whether or not you opened it or used it. You can't say to God, oh, you forgot me. No, you are gifted. Now, it takes a step of faith to believe, but it is true. You are gifted. But not only that, what is this gift? What does this what form does it take? It says here that, again, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. That means the appearance of God. God showing up in your life. See, as we use the gifts that we are given, as we use what God provides for us, the Holy Spirit is put on display for others to see. You know, I was uh, sorry to throw you under the bus here, Marilyn, but, but you brought it up earlier. You were talking about sending out cards. And I was amazed as you were talking about that, because I know you have great gifts of sending out cards. I love your cards. I have a few of them up in my office to send out to folks. That is a gift that you were given, to be able to know people who need them and make beautiful pieces of art to send out to them. That is a gift of God. And when things like that are sent by Marilyn, that is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. When a gift like that shows up on somebody's door and they see that card and they get that encouragement, that is the Holy Spirit at work in their lives because of a gift being used. And we all have something like that. And when you use it, God is on display. The Holy Spirit is there and active. And the purpose for it? The purpose for it? The common good. See, it's not just about you. These gifts aren't meant to build ourselves up. 
They're meant to build up the other person. See, we are not consumers. Now, we live in a consumer culture, so it's easy to forget that, but when it comes to church, we, we're not consumers. We don't come here to church in order to consume a spiritual product so we can get through our life, you know, through our week, and by the end of the week, we've consumed enough of it, we need to come back and get some more for consumption. We are not consumers, we are producers. See, God wants to use all of us, we're not spectators. There should be no spectators in the church. If if you're just a spectator, well, then you're not really living in the church then. You're just watching it. Now, there, there, there are not consumers. We should not be spectators. We are all a part of God's work and God's plan here in the church. Now, the thing is, the church in Corinth, they're getting some of that down. They might have even gotten some of that together. And yet, even with all that, they know some of them know they're gifted. You know, some of them might even be able to agree that it's all from God. It's not of them. You know, that God is working through them. Maybe they agree that they can see God at work, and maybe they even agree to some extent that it is for the common good. But what I found amazing is they still seem to have missed the point when it comes to these gifts, that it is meant to bring unity in the body and to build up the body, not each other. Because even using these things in that way, well, they, they, they got it wrong. So Paul wanted to make sure that they did not abuse their gifts, because that's something that can happen. Now, again, some in Corinth would agree with most of what we said already, but they still sought after the best gifts. You know, isn't that a human thing? You can imagine, you know, like day after Christmas or something, or when kids get back to school, you know, they all want to talk about their gifts, and they're all going to talk about who got the best gift, you know, and they're going to, they're, they're going to, they're going to rank themselves by how good of gifts they got. Well, what did they do to get their gifts? Nothing. They were given to them. But that's how humans work. Anytime we can find a way to get a, get a little bit up on someone else, we'll use it. And when it comes to gifts, it can be the same way. And apparently that was what was happening in Corinth. So in some cases, people were struggling to use their gifts. In other cases, people were using their gifts in a way to bring them glory. You know, in, in Corinth, when they came to the church service, what was happening was you had a lot of people who were trying to put on display all these gifts. They're trying to put on display, look at my gifts and how great they are. Pay attention to me. I'm the one to look at. I'm the one to pay attention to at this time. And they were squabbling in that order, trying to get the attention from one another, using the, more, you know, the most exciting gifts they could in order to grab that attention for themselves, to build themselves up. Well, if we do that, that is damaging. That destroys the unity. So Paul, you know, he's been making this argument, but now... As he's been making this case, he's been showing, you know, these gifts are not earned. They're given. Every gift comes from the same God for the same purpose. It's all for the common good. But here it is. Now he's going to lay out some gifts. They're putting them on display. They've been showing them off. But now, now he's going to give them a list and talk through them. Now, as he does this, as he pulls them out, what, he, what he's showing to them is this. First off, he sort of flips their order. As you'll see as we read through this, the last gift that's mentioned is speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues. As we will find out later, that was the issue going on in Corinth. People who could speak in tongues were getting up on stage, making a show of it, and catching all the attention in church, and using that you know, for full effect. But Paul flips that list, and he breaks down that, guess what? These are all from the same God. These all come from the same Spirit. They don't make you better. They don't let you put yourself on a pedestal. They are meant for unity. So let's read this here. This is uh, closing, or, you know, getting through the rest of our verses, 8 through 11, to hear them all at once. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. All right. There are all sorts of gifts. And in this, there is no ranking. There's no designation that this gift is better than this gift. They're all on the same level, and they're all from God. They're not gifts that make you a better person or a better Christian. Now, some may be more useful than others, 
But honestly, the ones that are more useful tend to be the ones that get less attention. I'd say Paul doesn't even include some of them on the list, but I would say some of the most, the, the most helpful, the, most, the, the gifts that will make the greatest impact are gifts like hospitality, gifts like helping and encouragement. Those are gifts that will change lives. But here he has this list, and it's not an exhaustive list. It's a list of gifts that were being exercised in Corinth, a list of gifts that they were probably having some issue with. Uh, but, but we'll go through this list just to see what he says here. You know, it starts, the first one he gives is this utterance of wisdom. Now, Paul does put this as the first place, and I get the feeling he does that because in Corinth, they were probably putting it in the last place. In other words, we'll get to the last one, tongues in the, at the very end, but they were putting that as number one. You know, speaking in tongues, that's the biggest thing to do, most important thing to do. And honestly, the utterance of wisdom, who really needs that? But what is the utterance of wisdom? Well, th that's a word of wisdom that's being given. And for Paul, when he says wisdom, it's talking about Jesus Christ. It's talking about his life. We've already dealt with that in 1 Corinthians, that Paul has dealt with the wisdom of the world, and the wisdom of the world, well, it doesn't work out too well. It's foolishness before God. Now, the, the wisdom of God... It seems foolish to the world, but the wisdom of God we see in the person of Jesus Christ. So an utterance of wisdom then would be a message that is given about Jesus that relates to our life and how to live it. A message about Jesus Christ that relates to our life. That is a gift. Some of you have a gift for this utterance or a word of wisdom that you can speak to a person about how Jesus has affected your life and how he can affect theirs. See, that's a, that's a word of wisdom. And he also says, the next one here, is this utterance of knowledge, a word of knowledge. Now, word of knowledge, you know, the first one was wisdom. The second one, this is knowledge. It comes from the Greek word gnosis, which is a pretty generic knowledge. Usually, it deals with head knowledge, what you know. And some people are gifted with teaching, that you're able to go ahead and teach people. You can break down facts and give them in a way that people can understand and they can add them to their knowledge. That is a gift from God that some people can do. Now, we also have faith here. Now, we read that one and we say, well, faith, don't we all have faith? Well, it's like many of these gifts. There are natural giftings. Some people actually can just teach out of a natural gift, but then there's a spiritual gift. And that goes, goes further beyond that. Well, when it comes to faith, I mean, if you are in the church, you, you have come to faith, you have faith, but some people, some people have great faith. They have a faith that is put on display. You can think of the great men and women of the faith throughout history. When you think of the, you know, the great names of Christians, I can think of like Corey Ten Boom's one that comes to mind often for me. But there are many, many others who, who are people of faith, and they endured great tragedy, great hardship. They endured trials, and they remained faithful. And things we'd look at and honestly say, God, that's great, but I would have given up by then. You know, I, I would have found a way out by then. And yet some people have this gift of faith that will never let go. That is a gift. Well, then he mentions gift of healings. Now, as he talks about that, um, some of the apostles had the ability to heal, and there were some healers like that. But this is a little, it seems a little more specific here, the way Paul's writing that. This is, this is a little more of the gift that you receive in your healing, that some people actually receive gifts of healing, that you are healed from your sickness because God has the power to do that. You know, and we are called to trust God in that. We, we obviously enjoy all the benefits of modern technology and medicine, as we should, because God gifted people in a natural way to be able to figure those things out. But God can bring healing, and not just physically, he can bring healing emotionally and spiritually. When you receive that and put that on display, that is the Holy Spirit at work in your life that can change other lives as well. Then he says also these working of miracles. This is putting God on display. Now we see this along with healing, especially some of those gifts of healing was particularly useful in the early church for establishing this, but we see this in the lives of the apostles and some of the early church members, that they were able to show these great, the great power of God on display. One that comes to mind for me is uh, one of the earliest miracles of the church on the day of Pentecost. And as they get up and they start speaking, and we see a miracle, God on display, as all the people are talking about, all the, all the people in that upper room start talking about Jesus, and everybody around the area starts hearing it in their own language. That was the power of God on display. All right, and then he says also prophecy. 
We're moving along in the list. When we hear prophecy, normally we think of uh, telling, you know, something of telling the future. Most prophecy is actually not having to do with the future, because what prophecy has to do with is telling the heart of God. That's telling the heart of God to somebody for his, to tell of his love, or <clears throat> a little bit harder, of his correction. A lot of the prophecy we have in Scripture has to do with the correction that God needed to do. And then uh, discernment of spirits, that's knowing right from wrong, being able to tell right from wrong. That's a spiritual gift to discern what is right and wrong. And they had to deal with spiritual things like we have to do with spiritual things. Sometimes you need that discernment, and some people are especially gifted for that. And at the bottom of the list, he puts the troubled ones. These are the ones that were causing an issue in Corinth. And this is what he says, the various tongues and the interpretation of tongues. As far as we can tell from 1 Corinth, this is dealing with some sort of language that they didn't understand, some ecstatic tongue that was being used in service. And it had a purpose to glorify God, but it was not being used to glorify God in Corinth. And it needed to be corrected. Now, some of these might sound a little more exciting than others. Some of them might sound like, well, that would get you attention. That would really grab people's attention. That would raise, you know, your social capital if you're using those. I mean, just imagine if you go, go out there and like, you know, Paul, we hear stories of Paul where his handkerchiefs were healing people. Imagine what that would do to you. That's not the point of gifts. That's not the point of having any gift because it doesn't elevate you or put you above other people. Now, what we saw in Corinth was that they thought that this last gift, this gift of tongues, was the gift to have. And that was the gift that would get you power in the church. And Paul's point here is to try and cut them down a bit. To point them back to the fact that it's not about building yourself up. It's about building up the church. Paul's purpose with this list is not to give us an exhaustive list. Maybe one of these gifts is a gift that you have. Maybe you do have a gift for a word of knowledge or, or a word of wisdom. You know, may, maybe you do have a gift of being able to speak God's heart to people. But this isn't an exhaustive list. Paul's point isn't to give an exhaustive list. He's doing this to make a point that you're not to rank these gifts. They all come from the same spirit. The problem we have when we try ranking things like this is whenever we rank something a person has, we begin to rank people, and then we put them in their orders some people are just better than other people. You know your place. Now, that's bad enough when it comes to the social economic stuff that we've seen in previous chapters. That's a lot worse when it comes to the spiritual side of things, to rank people spiritually. So, how do you abuse your gift? If we listen to Paul in this, you abuse it by either not using it, or you abuse it by elevating your gift and, and using that to say, well, you're better in some way. So it's either putting it away in the closet or taking it out and putting it in front of people's faces just to show how good you are. All right, so what are we to do? How are we to apply this? I want to go back to that second point and say, hold on to this one for now. Use your gift. If you want a place to start, I'll give you a place to start this week. You can do this. Praise your gift-giving God. Praise Him for your gift that has been given to you. Now, this will help you see Him. This will help you see Him rightly as a giver of gifts, and this will also help you see your gift. Maybe you know what your gift is. Maybe you don't know what it is. But praise Him for it. Praise Him for it so that you see Him rightly, and you see your own gifting rightly, knowing that He is the one who gave it. And then second, after praising Him, use your gift. Find a way to put that in action. That means trust the God who has gifted you, receive it without pride, and get out there and put that gift to use. So this week, if you want to experience the fruit of the Spirit in your life, you know, to, to see Him at work, get out there, use your gift, and serve. If maybe, maybe you're trying to find meaning or purpose in your life. Maybe you're in a time in your life where you're trying to figure things out again, try, trying to make sense of what's going on. Well, I'll tell you, what you should do then is get out there Use your gift and serve for the common good. Now maybe, maybe you have a problem, especially this time of year, you've been struggling to connect with people or you're in a new area trying to connect. Well, one thing you can do about that is get out there, use your gift, and serve. 
And if you're trying to discover your gift, maybe, maybe you haven't quite figured it out yet, maybe you've been asking God to show it to you, well, then I would suggest get out there, use your gift, and serve. Because you'll find out in the process of serving where God has gifted you. See, one of the greatest lies we believe, one of the things that really will bring us down is, is, is when we say, Lord, I'll serve you when I'm spiritually ready, thinking you're going to get to that point before you serve him, before you step out into that ministry he might be calling you to. Or, you know, God, I'll serve you when, when I know where you've gifted me. That was something I had to learn. You've you got to get out there and, and start actually using your gift so you know where it actually is. Or even, you know, God, I'll, I'll start doing this when I have the time. That's a laughable one. <laughs> yeah, your time will come. One. No, time doesn't just appear. God is the God who created time, who has gifted you for a purpose. He has given you the amount of time you need to step out and use the gifts you have. You just got to trust him for that. So God has given you what you need. And if you want to be spiritually ready, you want to know your gift, you want to have that time, honestly, get out and serve with the gift he has given you. Now, you may be sitting there saying, oh God, I really want to do that, but I just don't know where to start. I'll help you with one. One area where we've, uh, you know, have seen an area for service in this community is when it comes to the little kids, the children's ministry. So that, that might be a good place for you to start. We need people to help in the nursery. We need people in the Sunday school. I wouldn't mind if we had some people who wanted to help join us to uh, do the youth, uh, work with the youth on Sunday nights. And, and we're hoping soon to start up a good news club of one form or another. In fact, on December 12th during the fellowship dinner, we're going to be taking some time to, I'm going to be grabbing a few people to talk about that, to, to lay out some plans. And that's a way we can reach out, not just for our church and all the little ones we have here, but we've got a lot of little ones in this community uh, who, who need something, who need the gospel. Because honestly, if they don't hear it from you, they're not going to hear it from anybody. That's just the truth. And perhaps you have a gift of an utterance of wisdom or an utterance of knowledge that could fit right there. Maybe you have a gift of hospitality or you could open your home for something like that. Maybe you have a gift of patience that you can deal with little ones for the time that's needed. But in one way, I, you are gifted. Figure that out, get out there and use it. So if we are to be the church that God calls us to be, we have to, and you have to, use the gifts that God has given you. No one can do this for you. No one else can use your gift. I can't do it. You know, your spouse can't do it. Your friends can't do it. Somebody else in the church cannot do it. You are the only one who is able to use the gifts that God has given you. So get out there and use them.